I was a Catholic, a traditional Catholic, but I got tired of all the contradictions and constant mental gymnastics. I was tired of coping. I had to come to terms with reality. I had to, and so I looked into the claims of Eastern Orthodoxy and I prayed on it and I kept researching and they're right. And I think every Catholic should watch this video and stop coping. Five reasons I can't be Catholic. The Vatican has lost the faith. They do not profess the Orthodox Christian faith. The contradictions, not just in Vatican II, not just in Vatican I, in the entire post-schism church. There is a false unity. There is not oneness in the Catholic church. It's not real doctrinal unity, which is one of the four marks of the church. There's a lack of continuity with the early church and all the historical revisionism and forgeries. That's why I can't be Catholic. Let's get into it. I became Catholic in the first place because I thought the Catholic church was the most traditional. And, you know, I read Matthew in the, in the New Testament. You know, Peter is the rock. He was giving the binding and loosing powers. And so, you know, there's parallels in the Old Testament. You know, the role of the high priest, the new versus old rock. The old rock was Eliakim. He had the binding and loosing powers. So let's look back and see how Eliakim in the Old Testament functioned. In the Old Testament, we see Eliakim. He's a high priest of Israel. He receives the binding and loosing powers. Throughout the Old and New Testament, they refer to his priestly duties, the keys, powers. They're not singular. Now, in the New Covenant, the New Testament, there is a new high priest of the new Israel. Both of them, Eliakim and Peter, receive the keys and the glory of the house of David. The new Eliakim is Peter in the New Covenant. He is the first high priest, and he is the first bishop. And Peter, the rock, is the archetype for all bishops. And all bishops are vicars of Christ equally. There isn't anything higher. And this is exactly where we disagree with Catholics. I can't believe this because the Bishop of Rome is the first among equals. And this is a debate. Is the rock the Pope? Are we supposed to blindly follow the Bishop of Rome no matter what? Or is the rock the bishops? And Peter was the first bishop. Because we have to agree, all Catholics agree too. All bishops are the vicar of Christ. But Roman Catholics believe there's something higher, the papacy. And why the Bishop of Rome? Just because Peter died there? I mean, Peter was also the first bishop of Antioch. We say as Eastern Orthodox, because it is doubly apostolic, because of Peter and Paul. And this is why the Bishop of Rome is the first among equals. He has a primacy of honor. And we look at the early church, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome did not pick every bishop. It's not how the early church functioned. And it's not how orthodoxy functions to this day. And we see that the Vatican one mindset was not true in the early church. You have to admit it's an innovation. Now, is it legitimate? This is a debate, papal primacy versus supremacy, the universal jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome. We can just look at some early ecumenical councils to see what the view of the early church is that a bishop should be appointed by all the bishops in the province. It's an innovation that the Bishop of Rome picks every bishop. Now, if it's valid, then you're a Catholic. If it's invalid, then it's Eastern Orthodoxy. And it's not valid. They did not have the authority to do this. And I'll explain exactly how this development happened. I mean, we can see, again, the Bishop of Alexandria has jurisdiction in all of these, like the Bishop of Rome. The let the choice of the majority prevail. They're not just appealing. And the Bishop of Rome is not a dictator of the faith like it is in the Roman Catholic system. We can see this in the early church. We can even look at Pope Saints. They say, which in three places is the sea of one? Alexandria, Antioch, Rome. There isn't one sea that is above all. They are only, they are all equals. And Rome was the first among you. When we look at the history of why this happened, we see two systems emerge in history from the early church to the schism, collegiality and monarchy. So in the Eastern Roman Empire, you know, where the Eastern Orthodox patriarchs reside, they, we, they had a strong secular head, the emperor. This is a person who called the ecumenical councils. They had a college of all the bishops and patriarchs, and it was a separation between the emperor and they call it the bishops, but they worked together. They were one single organism versus in the West, the papacy alone was able to act as a center of unity for political and spiritual life. They were the only ones bringing stability. And they took a part in these ecumenical councils, but they didn't have to play with the, with the other bishops or with secular rulers, the other patriarchs. And so they were the sole authority. They commanded all. The Eastern patriarchs were not called to play this role. They were in Rome, the, the Bishop of Rome was an autocrat. He had absolute power. And so over time, we see monarchy in the West and collegiality in the East. And why does this happen? This happens because there is a power vacuum in the Western Roman Empire. This is why we get papal monarchy and the supremacy evolved out of necessity. I mean, early on, they were similar. You know, they spoke Latin and Greek. They were bilingual. But over time, the language and cultural differences compounded. And they sp split into, you know, to the Eastern and Western Empire. And the Western Roman Empire got really messed up, especially in 395, the fall of Rome. But Rome got constantly invaded by barbarians over and over again. There was no structure in the Western Roman Empire. And so Rome, the Vatican, out of foresome circumstances, had to fill the vacuum. You know, this is where we get the papal stage where the church is the state. This is different than in the East where they have the emperors and then they have the religious heads working together. In the West, it was one. And so we see as this happens, you know, as he gets political power, the West, the Bishop of Rome wants to consolidate all the power, centralize it in the papacy to survive. This happened so the West could survive pretty much. And we see that these are four very known forgeries. You can look them up. 
that were all used to, there's a theme. These are just a few forgeries that were used to revise history and expand the political and spiritual authority of the Bishop of Rome. Like the first one, a bunch of forged papal biographies that were papal propaganda. The Samantian forgeries, we get the phrase, no one judges the first C. Still in Catholic canon law, the first C is judged by no one. And why are you lying about something if you already own, own it? And that's where we get, you know, supposed transfer um, authority over Rome, the Western part of the Roman Empire to the Pope. You, you don't have to lie about something you already own. Again, this, this last decree expands the legal jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome. All these forgeries, these lies were used to expand the political and spiritual authority of the Bishop of Rome. And so, you know, there's a, ev these ever expanding papal claims. They make schism inevitable because there's a tyrannical bishop. He was born out of unfortunate circumstances. He did have a primacy of honor. He did not have absolute supremacy. This would eventually lead to schism. And the last straw was a filial quay. And just because some, not all church fathers stress being in communion with Rome does not mean that unum sanctum, the papal bull, it says that one must bend the knee to the Roman pontiff, to the Pope for salvation. This is not in continuity with the early church. If someone tells you to always listen to your parents, does that mean that your parents can never be wrong? And so too with the Roman church. Even if St. Paul said to the epistles to the Romans that they could potentially be cut off like a branch, they could be cut off. There isn't anything special. They have a primacy of honor. And so this council, you know, in the early church, you know, the first one of the first ecumenical councils, the first few, um, but the first one at Constantinople, you know, so Catholics established that people who die outside of communion with Rome are not Catholic. But this council was called out of communion with Rome, presided over someone who was out of communion with Rome and died that way. But it's now teaching of the Holy Spirit because a Pope a few centuries later says it's teaching of the Holy Spirit. It was convoked by someone who's not a saint and died that way. Yet it is now an accepted council. How can this make any sense? This doesn't. And, you know, later after the schism, this is the Catholic view up until Vatican II, pretty much, that pagans, Jews, schismatics, even if you have a baptism of blood, you have to die in communion with the church in order to be Catholic. Yet this is a contradiction. I mean, and this is in 381. And then we get to the filial quay. This is simple. The Third Ecumenical Council forbid, forbid and anathematized any, any additions to the creed. And it was reiterated at the Eighth Ecumenical Council. I think this is pretty clear. The filial quay was something, it was added to the creed and the son. Rome added it. Yet it's very clear. No additions to the creed. No additions to the creed. And so how the filial quay spreads, the and the son to the creed, it starts in Spain, you know, it spreads in Western Europe. And Charlemagne and his writers, they're the ones to first make it an issue. They accuse the Greeks of heresy because they were citing their original form. And Rome was actually using the creed without filioque for a long time. And one of the popes even deliberately had the creed without the filioque inscribed on silver plaques and set up because he knew it was a mistake to tamper with the creed. It wasn't until 850 that the Greeks finally looked at the filioque and saw that it's theologically incorrect and they didn't have the authority to do this. So this is why we get the great schism of 1054 because of these ever growing papal claims re re rely, that rely on forgeries and the filioque, they officially added and the son to the creed, even though it's specifically forbidden and it's theologically incorrect. So after growing apart for centuries, the Pope tried to excommunicate the, communicate the patriarch of Constantinople during his liturgy. I mean, they've always had beef because Constantinople is, was the new Rome. They've always had beef, but the Pope is pushing the issue because it's an ever growing thing. Rome had some primacy, but not absolute supremacy. This is where we get first among equals. We have the four other Petrine seas, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Constantinople. Why would we trust this one? This one, just because they're all equals. It's four versus one. You can't add to the creed. And if it's really that important, why do the Eastern Catholic churches still recite the creed without the filioque? Because I believe, and I, I think Pope Benedict would have agreed with me, we eventually need the filioque taken out of the Roman creed. And go and ask an Eastern Catholic. Go to one of their churches. Ask what they think about the filioque. See what happens. They don't like the filioque. It's a contradiction. And then we skip ahead a few centuries. We get to the Renaissance papacy. Know them by their fruits. What is the Renaissance known for? Secularization, humanism, liberalism, modernism, heterodox art. Who funded all this? The Vatican. You know, they're letting their ideology be known. All these ideals flourish under the papacy. The, the popes cared about political power, worldly matters, and neglected their spiritual duty. This neglect literally laid the groundwork for the Protestant Reformation. Yeah, just one example. Yes, I get the Pope in sin, but we literally get the most corrupt Pope in the history of the Catholic Church. He had five kids, nepotism, bribery, scandalous sex. Um, his successors described him as one of the most outstanding popes in St. Peter. And this is just, you know, a few centuries after schism. We get this. And what else do we get? All this art funded by the Vatican. What's up with all the naked people? Seriously, what's up with all the naked people? What's up with God, the Father incarnate? I don't, God never, the Father never became incarnate. And we get, you know, the white Italian Jesus. And the problem with this is you're planting seeds. You're removing the history of these, you know, oh, if Jesus can be white, why can't he be black? Why can't he be Asian? Well, the thing is, Jesus wasn't that. He was who he was. He was a real person. He was a Galilean Jew. And the thing is, when you start symbolizing it, oh, Jesus can be made in our image. No, this is, I, icons and religious art needs to display history. And you're planting the seeds for watering down, you know, religious art and then the faith and then the Bible. And then it's all just a symbol. Oh, Jesus didn't actually exist. This makes the Protestant Reformation and the Enlightenment and Western atheism inevitable with heterodox ideas like this. Because that point of icons are to display people, personhood, 
real events, history. They aren't just symbols, they're history. And then we get to Vatican I, they dogmatize the mythology of the papacy, confirming that the Pope has always had absolute supreme authority above all bishops, above all rulers, using forgeries to justify it all. They define the ineffectability of the church, will be really, which will be really important later, and they add papal infallibility. This is not the mindset of the church of the first millennium. The Eastern Catholics ignore, they reject, they doubt Vatican I, which they can't do. The, El the Melkite patriarch even walked out and refused to sign Vatican I because they see it as another Western innovation, which it is. And Eastern Catholics by themselves refute Rome. They consider themselves Orthodox that are in communion with Rome. But that doesn't really make sense because the Eastern Orthodox, they believe all the Eastern Orthodox things, but the thing is you can't believe in both. That you they recite the creed without the filioque. You can't believe you can't believe the filioque and also not believe it. And the thing is, go and ask them. They don't like the filioque. They venerate saints, you know, Palamas, Marker, Ephesus, that the Catholic Church used to call heretics. And it shows that the Catholic Church is just like venerate whoever you want, do whatever you want, just submit to the Pope. The Uniates, the Chalcedonian Catholic Church, the Melkite. They're all schismatic in spirit. Just, just go ask one. Just go visit one of those churches and talk to them about orthodoxy and see if they're if they really have unity. They really just stay with Rome for political, historical reasons. And they were bought out by Vatican money a long time ago. And, and other reasons. There's other reasons. But it shows that there's a false unity. They aren't one, which is one of the four marks of the church. They never got assimilated. It's just about submit to the Pope, do whatever you want. I don't care. Just submit to the Pope. That's what the Pope says to these Eastern Catholics, pretty much, because he allows them to do all these orthodox things, which is a contradiction. They refute Rome. And then we get to the encyclicals to get the kind of mindset of the church at the time. I mean, we have Pope Pius having an encyclical against modernism. What is the Catholic church full of nowadays? Modernism. Then we get Martilio Animos. And this, just, Martilio Animos is so important. And you read in Pope Pius, you really get the mindset of the church. Is The apostolic see has never allowed subjects to take part in the assemblies of non-Catholics. And I'm sure Pius at this time was referring to like other Christians. He has never allowed. And what do we get? 58 years later, we get John Paul II at Assisi. This is a day and night difference from Matilio Animos to John Paul at Assisi. If you don't know what happened at Assisi, just look up the spirit at Assisi. Just look at what happened. I don't know what you call this. Really, Pope St. John Paul II, I'm not here to judge his soul. I'm just saying what the Catholics say. They, he put the one true faith in all the, you know, the, the other Catholics, the, the cardinals and everything. They put the same, they put it on the same level as pagan voodoo, witch doctors, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, Jews, Native Americans, all their prayer services, joint common father prayer. He put the Catholic faith on the level of every other religion. He accommodated them all, giving them rooms that have not been blessed, removing crucifixion, whatever. He let the, the, the Buddhists put a Buddha on top of the altar. And this didn't just happen once. This happened again at Milan. This happened again at Assisi. This is just being religiously indifferent. Some would say this is apostasy. And apostasy is a different level of sin. It is a different level of sin. And truth is being relativized. You can't put the one true faith on the level of every other faith in the world. And we can look at the Bible. I mean, this is the view of the, the church pretty much before Vatican II. Anything that's not Trinitarian, not Christian, they sacrifice to the devils and not to God. So devil worship and being indifferent to the one true faith, it's a day and night difference between Pius and John Paul II. You can't tell me this is a continuity. This is at one time, they say they have never allowed the assemblies of non-Catholics. And then we have a Pope saint putting the one true faith on the level of everything else. I mean, if you're Catholic, how do you make sense of this? It, and it's repeated again and again in their statement. John Paul II, he said, may St. John the Baptist protect Islam. Not for the conversion of Islam, protect Islam. That's like saying protect Arianism because they have the same heresy where they deny the divinity of Christ. That's not good. They make every excuse for a Jewish reading of the Bible as a possible one. Why? We should be helping them convert, not making them making excuses for them not to convert. They say to the believers of Islam, to whom we are united in the adoration of the one true God. But that's the thing. We don't. There isn't some generic monotheist Abrahamic God. There's only the Trinity. They don't worship the Trinity. And then again, in his Angelus addresses, here's him getting another uh pagan blessing he said great religion to the world hundreds of times great religions religions there's, there's only a great religion and you're the pope you're a saint and you're saying great religions there's only one great religion and it's christianity and we look at this zapotec witch blessing i mean if you go in the traditional catholic view before the church in the orthodox view everything that is not christian is two devils he's kissing the quran i mean and then we it's not just john paul ii it's also benedict uh, how many times did you go to the jewish prayer services where they pray for their messiah the Messiah already came. That's what he should do as Pope, not taking part in these assemblies. At a mosque, praying towards Mecca, doing the Muslim prayer, prayer thing. I mean, what, what do you call this? What, I mean, what do you call this? This is day and night difference. Again, again, making more excuses. It's of course possible to read that the Old Testament, so that it is not directed towards Christ. No, the Trinity is all over the Old Testament. The Trinity is the only God. And the Old Covenant is not valid because Jesus fulfilled it. Um, and he also says that um, he offers good wishes for a rabbi's mission, a rabbi's mission. No, the rabbi's mission should be to become Christian. You shouldn't wish them good wishes on your mission. You're the Pope. Again, <laughs> um, he says, respect for the Catholic Church for Islam. You know, respecting something that denies Christ, that rejects the Trinity. I mean, come on.
the other great religions, again, other great religion, religious traditions, Islam is just, yes, it's, it's so great. Uh, you guide Muslims, to, um, believers, and train them in the Islamic faith. You have a great responsibility. No, their great responsibility is to become Christian, to become Orthodox. And then again, John Paul II and Benedict, they both routinely gave communion to a Protestant, Brother Roger. He was a Presbyterian. He received the Catholic sacrament every morning. John Paul and Benedict both gave him. Um, isn't this kind of a contradiction? I thought that uh, only Catholics could receive the Eucharist. Yet they know better. They're the popes. This is mortal sin for him, for him, according to Catholic law. I mean, how does this make any sense? It doesn't. It's so reflective in their books, in their talks, in their actions. Benedict, Francis, Paul, John Paul, they've all repeatedly promulgated heresy and committed seeming impacts acts of apostasy. It's just a new normal. They're, and then they do things like this, the Abrahamic family family house. I mean, what is this? There isn't some generic Abrahamic monotheistic God. There is and always has been only one true God, the Trinity, Jesus Christ. Anything that denies the Trinity is not great. It's evil. It's evil. This idol worship is evil. They know better. They know better. And then we look at the modern and future Catholic uh, faith, where it's going. You know, with natural theology, you know, Jews, Muslims, Christians, pagans, every, everyone, we just worship the same God, just in different ways, right? Uh, so we see in the dialogue, promote human fraternity. You know, Catholics, they get the first class ticket to heaven. Orthodox Protestants, second class. Everyone else, they get business class. But traditional Catholics and Eastern Orthodox know this isn't the case. There's one God, the Trinity, false religions, Protestants. They need to join the true church. But that's not how the Roman Catholic Church functions anymore. I mean, we've had multiple popes. We've had decades of this indifferentism, of this, and this new Abrahamic faith, like, faith stuff. And the Pope himself says, don't convert. That's a venom against ecumenism. And the Pope is a supreme teacher of all Christians. But where national theology is taking your church is that the Pope is a supreme teacher in the sole key bearer of all the world's religions. The Pope is going to be the king, the dictator of the entire world, of all the world's faith. I don't like where this is going. And Francis, what else do you call him besides a notorious heretic? He's the Pope. He says, who am I to judge when asked about uh, you know, Skittles, about homosexual unions? He says, who am I to judge? Well, you're the Pope. You should be help, sh help them, cure them of their sin. Don't say, who am I to judge? Help them. He says, it's not listed to convince someone of your faith. It's as strong as venom, the venom against the ecumenical path, path. It's just ridiculous. I mean, it's just so obvious. You can't even trust the Pope, the supreme teacher of all Christians. He embraces James Warren with the uh, Skittles, the LGBTQI plus ministry. He says, it's a very grave sin for Catholics to try and convert Orthodox. Yet, you know, you know, you go to the Council of Florence, that papal bull, schismatics aren't going, are going to hell, apparently, according to Catholic uh, thought, traditional Catholic thought. Yet it's a grave sin to try and convert them. This doesn't make any sense. You can read his encyclicals. It's it's obviously a day and night difference. The universal fraternity, dialogue, every socialist priority. You can't just reject his encyclicals. They're ordinary magisterium. They're binding. We all know he's just making it obvious. His actions, his words, his books, his encyclicals. He is the best orthodox apologetic, apologist. Is he Catholic? Even Vigano says now. Because a system, it doesn't really work. If a valid pope isn't Catholic, it doesn't work. And how far can one go and still be Catholic? Like the voodoo, pagan, Buddhist, Zapotec, witch, Dr. Blessing saying great religions being indifferent. This isn't material, material heresy. This is formal, repeated heresy. You can't tell me the popes don't know the faith. False gods, prophets, and devils, there's nothing great about them. They literally lead people to hell. There's nothing great about that. Praying towards Mecca in a mosque like Benedict did, like the, they all do. You know, Aquinas said praying in the tomb of Muhammad, you would cease to be Catholic. And the thing is, you don't have to wonder how far someone would go can go and still be Catholic. Apostasy and heresy are different levels of sin, one that call for instant excommunication. Code of canon law declared apostates, uh, heretics, schismatics, ipso facto excommunication. You don't have to wonder. And you know them by their fruits. I mean, like I said, it's daily heresy and seeming acts of apostasy. Latest, Joe Biden's a good Catholic and keep receiving communion. So you can be the most pro-abortion, you know, pro-Skittles president ever, but, you know, just keep receiving communion, even though supporting those things is moral sin. Just keep receiving communion. You, if, if, Catholic, if Catholicism is true, then he, Francis' soul is at risk. Biden's soul is at risk. And he just puts so many souls in danger by saying something so irresponsible. And Jesus didn't come for a political revolution. He made that clear. You know what he came? He came to cure us from sin and he established a visible church, the hospital, to cure us, the sacraments, not for a political revolution, not for a socialist utopia. What does the Roman Catholic Church really care about now? They're just an NGO. You know, they just care about human fraternity, dialogue, universal tolerance, and respect and for all religions. And we look at, I mean, it's just so reflective in what, in what they do. You know, Health and Soul, their conference, they invite Chelsea Clinton, Dr. Fauci, all, all these people. These are not Catholic heads. Like, what is going on in the Vatican? They are rebelling against their own tradition and liturgy. Tradition is custodos in September. You know, you know the German bishops are blessing Skittles. You know, they're sli sleep. Fr Francis is sleeping. They embrace all the evils of the world in the church and in the world sleeping. But he, of course, goes out of his way to restrict the Latin mass, not only once, but again, on December 18th. He's making it obvious. He's making it so obvious that he hates the Latin Mass with these restrictions and more restrictions. He wars against the, the, the traditional Latin Mass, like this, that parish bulletins cannot have the old liturgy publicizing them. I mean, seriously, they can't, they can't be celebrated at the same time, the new Mass. He urges the seminary teachers 
to make sure the seminarians know, have a rich understanding and to, uh, of an understanding and experience of the richness, the richness of the liturgical reforms called by the Second Vatican Council. And then if a priest gets sick and was going to celebrate the old rite, he can't be substituted. I mean, these are just such arbitrary rules. He's just doing everything he can to suppress the traditional Latin Mass. Priests cannot celebrate the old rite and new Mass on the same day. It's obvious. Your Pope, your the Supreme Teacher of Christians, hates the traditional Latin Mass. But it's like even the traditional Latin Mass, you know, when I was going to it, this is kind of the view of the church and the view that I started to have is, you know, the Catholic church is the same in every climate nation and it has the same language. Well, that's actually a heresy thinking that, you know, Hebrew, Greek, Latin are the only valid liturgical languages. And, you know, you can't be Latin only. And I love Latin. It should definitely has a, a part in the Western Orthodox tradition, but you can't be a Latin only person. And, you know, we see, you know, the mindset of the saints, you know, the vicar of Christ cannot be the Antichrist. I feel like that's that's pretty logical. Yet, you know, I know saints are fallible, but you, but you get the mindset. If the Pope is an incarnate devil, we ought not to raise our heads up against him, but calmly lie rest down to rest on his bosom. He who rebels, rebels against the Father is condemned to death, for which we do to him, we do to Christ, and we honor Christ if we honor the Pope. We dishonor Christ if we dishonor the Pope. But the but the Christ, the vicar of Christ, cannot be the Antichrist. It doesn't make any sense. This is not the obedience, the level of obedience to authority we're supposed to have. We're supposed to follow the Pope if he's the incarnate devil. I don't think Jesus would want us to follow the incarnate devil. It, it, this is the level that they, the, the mindset of, of how obedient to authority. I mean, it's crazy. Reading more encyclicals, you know, specifically condemning Freemasonry and read Fratelli Tutti. Um, but it says, hide under the mask of universal tolerance, respect for all religions, and caving and craving to reconcile the maxim of the gospel with those of revolution. The Catholic Church promotes so much liberation theology, especially Francis, and respect for all religions and natural theology, the mask of universal tolerance. And we can look at other, you know, saints at this time, you know, like St. Mother Teresa. Like I said, I'm not here to judge their soul. I'm just saying that there's a difference between what traditional Catholicism is and what modern Catholicism and what orthodoxy is. And it's very clear, you, respect for all religions is not, is not good. So you read your books, we shall not impose our faith on anyone, but have a profound respect for all religions. I've always said we should help a Hindu become a better Hindu, a Muslim, a better Muslim, a Catholic, a better Catholic. What? What? I mean, this is just day and night difference. And this is a saint. It's very confusing. Then we get to the, oh, the best part, Vatican II. All the errors and contradictions just become comical, honestly. You know, religious liberty, ecumenism, collegiality, natural theology, the new mass. It's really a secularization of the Catholic church, like with something like religious liberty. Where Catholic, it gets Catholic countries to remove Catholicism from the constitution, which is objectively bad. You know, this has happened in South Latin America. And you know what happens? A bunch of Protestant missionaries come in teaching the prosperity gospel, making them all Protestant. Well, you can thank Vatican II for that because they promoted religious liberty and all these other, you know, bad heterodox things according to Catholic standards. The new mass, all the liturgical abuses, the clown mass, the, I mean, what is this? It's a goof. There's so many liturgical abuses. And why? Because Protestants had a big influence on Vatican II. It was heavily influenced to make the Catholic mass more palatable to a Protestant service. They removed anything too Catholic. An altar, that's a table. The sacrifice, the meal, the removal of prayers, watering down the Catholic church. So it's just another institution in the world. Watering down the priesthood. So he's just another person in the world. You know, he doesn't, you know, read the gospel. Uh, lay people can hand out communion. Um, and, and teach the catechism class, it waters down. And they got rid of cassocks, come on. Um, and then we get to Latin mass. I mean, there's nearly twice as many prayers. Why would you cut the amount of prayers in, in half? I mean, it just seems very odd. And what does Martin Luther say? You know, who started the Protestant Reformation? Take away the mass, destroy the church. And what do we see? We see a nation without priests. We see divorce. We see no one's getting married. We see a shattering of families. And we see a max exodus of Catholics. Destroy the mass, destroy the church. Yet this is a, this is a valid and infallible council. And we see this everywhere in the architecture. I mean, look at this. This is just like any Protestant church. I mean, look at this. This is just looks like a universal Unitarian thing. I mean, it's just completely modernist. This is a table for a meal instead of an altar for a sacrifice. Versus you look at, you know, traditional Catholicism. This looks Catholic. All the Gothic architecture. It's an altar for a sacrifice. The communion room. All of this. This is beautiful. In the SSPX, SSPX, they are building beautiful Catholic churches. Look at versus this. No one wants to maintain this. It's ugly. It's going to die. Versus this, SSPX are at least building something beautiful. We'll talk about them later. And then also, you know, canon, you know, your laws don't make sense. Orthodox can receive sacraments without conditions. Come on. Schism is mortal sin. Schismatics, Eastern Orthodox can receive the Eucharist. Your Pope, your Pope says not to convert Orthodox. The Roman Catholic Church says Orthodox have valid sacraments. So why would I be Catholic? I'm just going to be Eastern Orthodox. You're, I mean, your Pope, I can receive your Eucharist. Schism may just... Must not be that big of a, a deal. I mean, seriously. I mean, this is it's just a joke and shows all the contradictions. And some they think, oh, the SSPX, the FSSP, it's an oasis. This is where we're practicing real Catholicism. It's a must, it's a mustard seed. But the thing is, it's not a coincidence that Galatianism, huge movement in France, you know, a couple of centuries ago, it advocated for the administrative independence from the papal control of the Roman Catholic Church. You think it's a coincidence that a French archbishop, Marcel Lefebvre, founded the SSPX? The movement is still the biggest in France. It's a neo-Galatianist movement. They're trying to do Catholicism without the Pope. He got excommunicated after he made some bishops. And, you know, the FSSP split off of the SSPX when this happened. So this is their father. 
And, and, you know, they lifted the excommunication, but still I'll talk about them later, but look at, this is obviously just a neo-Galatianist movement, the SSPX and the FSSP. They're like, we'll only accept what is traditional and Catholic. They're trying to do Catholicism without the Pope. They straight out reject the new mass and Vatican too. Um, and they, they're trying to do Catholicism without the Pope. They're being Protestant with their popes, with their doctrine, their councils, their encyclicals, only except what is trad. Uh, this is SSBX. This is Taylor Marshall. I don't know if they realize what they're doing, but it's neo Galatianist. It's nothing new. It's just an old movement. It's a new version of it. They can't do this without being schismatic in spirit. And here's exactly why because they are questioning, they're rejecting, and doubting the indefectibility of the church as established in Vatican I. I mean, the SSBX has their own bishops with overlapping jurisdictions. They say not to go to the new mass that you have no obligation to. They say Vatican II is in error. They say communion in the hand is, is mortal sin. Even at the FSSP, I went to confession. They told me communion in the hand is mortal sin. 98% of your church has a new mass. They have communion in the hand. They accept Vatican II. We can't have the belief that 2% of the church is practicing real Catholicism. You have to like it all, the Novus Ordo, Vatican II, and the Pope. And here's exactly why. Vatican I, it established the indefectibility of the church. It will remain in the visible institution founded by Christ. You can't be a set of a contest because of Vatican I, the visible church will remain. You can't have the view that 98% of the church and the Pope are an error. You can't recognize and resist. You can't do that. If I was going to stay Catholic, I have to embrace the Vatican II church happily and be obedient to authority because that's what it's about. And this doctrine is to be believed by all the faithful of the ancient and unchanging faith. You can't tell me the Catholic faith hasn't changed. It clearly has changed a lot. And they were supposed to condemn the contrary errors, which are so harmful to the Lord's flock. Yet we see a max exodus of Catholics, you know, specifically in the West. There are so many errors, yet Vatican I says that's not going to happen. Vatican I, again, you know, you are bound to submit to the Pope, not only, not only in matters of faith and morals, but also in discipline, also in discipline. You need to submit to the Pope. Indefectibility. The church is going to be kept pure and uncontaminated wherever it received, not just in 2%, wherever it's going to be kept pure. How long has the church been giving error? Depends how traditional you are. It's indefectible, or it was supposed to be. Then we get, it's all affirmed in Vatican II, the Lumen, in Lumen Gentium. You have to accept this. Um, when he is not speaking, even when he is not speaking ex cathedra, you have to be acknowledged with reverence and you have to sincerely adhere to his judgment and you have to manifest his mind and will. And that's the thing you'll notice is that that's what it's about. It's about obedience to authority. This is what Roman Catholicism, obedience to authority and manifesting the Pope's mind and will. And, order, you know, his encyclicals, they're still binding. Ordinary magisterium is binding. And the church was supposed to, can and will not bind the flock to error that they have. Um, and then the practical reality of being Catholic 2022, who are you going to trust? You know, liberal Novus Ordo, they're obviously heretical. They're neo-Protestant. They promote sin. They're religiously indifferent. They're dying of fast. They promote universal salvation, you know, like Francis and Martin, you know, promoting Skittles. I mean, Protestants have been there, done that. They're dying the fastest. Like caving to the world doesn't work. And you have the conservative Novus Ordo, and you still have to live with all these contradictions in Vatican II, in Vatican I, the new mass, the post-Vatican II popes. The, you have to deal with, this isn't one church is a point. You know, Eastern Catholics, you're going to trust them. You know, they venerate, quote unquote, heretic saints. They uh, recite without the filioque. Go to Eastern Catholic Church. Talk to them. They reject. They doubt many dogmas, councils. They are orthodox. They are very, they are literally just Eastern Orthodox that stay in communion with Rome. I don't know. The Roman Catholic Church and, and the Orthodox are too different. The, that's why the Eastern Catholics refute them. Um, and then the SSPX and FSSP, they're neo galatianists And also they're saying that basically most of the church, 98% of the church is in error. And all the new canonizations, how do you make sense of it? You can't do that. You're going to trust a set of acquaintances? I mean, at least they're consistent. I mean, some of these things call for instant excommunication, but they're denying the fundamental attributes of the church. It's self-refuting. And it's just an internet church. You can't even trust your Pope. He says not to convert Orthodox. The heretical come in every other week. He's indifferent towards Catholicism. Even Vigano says non-Catholic Pope. And yet this is one church. I'm saying there's no safe spot for you to trust. There's no safe spot in this. This is not one church. You have to embrace Vatican II and the new mass in Francis. I had this problem. You know, I was trying to help someone, you know, share the gospel with them. And I'm like, do I take them to the SSPX, FSSP, Novus Ordo? Like, oh, we need the Pope for unity, but the past five popes are bad. They promulgated a council that teach error in a new mass that is bad. And if you're a set of a contest, you have to say, we need the Pope, but the Pope isn't really the Pope. It's just, it's cognitive dissonance. It's mental gymnastics. It, it literally will drive you insane. You know, come be Catholic only at a certain parish. You have, you can't do that. You have to accept all of it. I can't do that. This is why Francis is suppressing traditional Catholicism. Because Rome has always been the supremacist, tyrannical. And now they're finally revolting against, you know, their own traditions, their own theology, their own liturgy. Um, because this is what it involves too. Obedience to the Pope above all else, manifesting his mind and will. And we look at the, the future of Catholicism. Is there any hope? I mean, even if you got Pope Pius, you know, the 13th, you know, the most based Pope ever, the church is still erred. And there's so many contradictions that, I mean, and the thing is, is that a Pope could do it. Because according to Catholic law, he could excommunicate anyone. He could change what, the entire liturgy because he is, no one judges him, according to Catholics. What are you likely going to get? Like, that's that wouldn't fix the church, and you're not going to get it. What you're probably going to get is Pope Francis II. And how far can one strain be Catholic? I mean, is, was Martin Luther Catholic when he died and served the Lutheran Church? 
Joe Biden Catholic, Nancy Pelosi, they reject Catholic dogma. I mean, it's Francis, it's John Paul. How far can a person stray and still be Catholic? And the post-Vatican II church, you can't trust them. You can't trust the Pope. You can't trust the teacher of all Christians. It's a centralized system. It's a house of cards. If the Pope isn't even Catholic, the system doesn't really work. And the quote unquote conservatives, you know, Benedict, they're the liberals and modernists because it's not just Francis or Vatican II or Vatican I. It's so much deeper. Rome's been this way for over a thousand years. The innovators, it's all about submission to the Pope. Eastern Orthodoxy is the only answer. Christ established a visible church. They have sacraments. They have apostolic succession. They have an ancient liturgy. They don't embrace false religions. They aren't infested with skittle pedophile priests. They don't have modernists and liberals. Well, to the level that Rome does. Obviously, every church is full of sinners. But they are orthodox. You can trust the other patriarchs, the other four Petrine seas that Rome rebelled against. They're still together. Together, Constantinople, Jerusalem, Alexandria, and Antioch. They survived. And they're the same church of the first millennium because they are the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The gates of hell will not prevail. That's why I'm going to get chrismated in the Eastern Orthodox Church. They are both dysfunctional. They're made of sinners. I'd rather deal with orthodoxy's dysfunction because their problems are the same that the early church had because they are the church that has remained true, true to tradition. So some common misconceptions and objections is, oh, well, the, the Eastern Catholic, they, they allow divorce. No, they're, they're both very strict. But the thing is, look at the Catholic system with annulments. It sets up a really weird situation. You never know if you're truly married, you know, because annulments say it never was a marriage and you can get unlimited annulments. That's, that's just chaos and just, it doesn't make any sense. Oh, they allow contraceptive. Again, Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics are both very strict. They don't allow abortive contraceptive. It's like saying the Roman Catholic Church allows contraceptive because they allow natural family planning. But even the super trad Catholics don't even have don't even like natural family planning. Like I said, they have they have similar views. Oh, it's too ethnocentric. It's like saying, oh, the Rome, that's just full of Italians. It's not always full of Italians. Great, you know, the Greek churches, they're not always full of Greeks. And this is mainly an argument in America. But a hundred years ago, there was Polish Catholic, there was Irish Catholic, there was German Catholic. But you know, new immigrants over time, you know, like I went to a Greek Orthodox church. There was Indians, there was Russians, there was Greeks, there was Americans, there was everyone. Um, and these same arguments we used against the early church. Oh, they can't call an ecumenical council. Well, do you know what an ecumenical council is? They were called by emperors, Constantine, Theodosius, the Eastern Orthodox Slav councils. Rome just calls all the councils ecumenical in name. And how good are these councils if they wreck your church, your tradition, and your liturgy? And then the next argument, oh, they're just in schism. Well, uh, they break, they sometimes break communion over small things, but not formal schism because they actually care about doctrinal unity. And that's more important. The Roman Catholic Church has administrative unity, but not doctrinal unity. It's just, just submit to the Pope, believe whatever. It's a false ecumenism. Ecumenism is supposed to get closer to doctrinal unity in the truth. And all these same arguments can be used in the, against the early church because they had the same problems. Last argument, oh, well, which Orthodox? Well, there's only Oriental and Eastern. Oriental have been correct Christology. They think that there's only one will, not two, which just denies the divinity of Jesus. And the Eastern Orthodox have the historical, you know, Patri Petrine Seas, the patriarchs. And there actually may be a reunion soon because it may have just been a translation error, which would be really good um, if we could get reunion. But the thing is, Orthodoxy is so much more. It's so much more beautiful. It's not just Catholicism without the Pope. It's a different way of thinking about sin, about Jesus. They have theosis. The West is so scholastic and trying to break faith down into a science. You know, the legalism, the black versus white, moral versus venial sin, versus the mysticism of the East. They, you know, the gray areas. We can't know things like purgatory or indulgences for sure. I mean, oh, you do this and you get one day off purgatory. I feel like we can't know that. We can't know for sure. And what's up with denying infants communion? Why can they, they not participate in the graces of God if they are baptized? It doesn't make any sense. And also deeper theological issues that you can't, you can't believe in both, like the essence energy versus divine simplicity. Overall, there's a theme that I noticed in my studies is that Rome has always been, the, they've for a thousand years, they've been an innovator, supremacist, tyrannical. And now 2022, they're rebelling against their own tradition. I would have to ignore all this to stay Catholic. And who am I going to trust? They all say different things. Who is actually Catholic if the Pope isn't even Catholic? Thank you. If I messed up anything, comment. I care about the truth. You know, if I was disproven, I would become Catholic again, but I don't see how you reconcile these things. So thank you for watching.